Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm Dominic, and this is Gunny, and this is Pang Chang. So we are working on serverless platform at Neighbor. And we are so glad to be here today. And we're going to talk about the potential performance issues in container-based platforms and what we did to overcome that issues. We will mainly talk about the Apache OpenWhisk, but I think it will be also useful for those who are working on any other container-based platforms. OK, so first, Gunny will give a speech. Please welcome him. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Gunny, and I'm de developing a serverless platform and neighbor in Korea. I'm here to explain to you briefly uh, what serverless is uh, before we talk about the main topics. How many of you uh, have used serverless or, or using serverless like uh, Amazon Lambda and Azure, fun Azure Function? Oh, OK. Thank you. <laughs> now let's get started. So this Google trend graph show that server's interest has, has increased uh, over the last five years. And there are also many server's conferences around the world. And there are also a lot of open source related servers, Apache OpenIS, Google's Knative, and many more open source are actively competing. And there are even a variety of platforms that make up for the lack of serverless, uh, authentication, security, and, and management, monitoring, data science. And there are a lot of articles on the topic, is serverless the future of the cloud? So what is serverless computing? So when you hear the word the serverless, it's easy to think about it as running without a server, but serverless not is serverless. There's actually a server in cloud vendor that provides serverless platform, hardware, host OS, hypervisor, and so on, are all managed by cloud vendor. Of course, for user, this is uh, meaningless. Users feel like there is no server. Serverless platform offer users the value of independence from infrastructure. And cloud vendor provide users uh, with, mo uh, with a monitoring tool for observability. Uh, because users have to make sure that their function is done well. Anyway, users only need to focus on uh, their business logic and code. I think this is one, uh, the one of the major benefits of serverless. And serverless includes uh, backend service, um, database as a service, function as a service. So today we're gonna to gonna talk about the function as a service. Function as a service has five main characteristics. Event-driven, isolated execution, execution stateless, auto-scaling, pay as you use. The first is event-driven. The fast platform mainly executes the function in response to external events. External events are your backend service, database change event, and CLI, mobile, web UI, cron job, and so on. Because it works in response to any external event, fast platform are often used and sort of as the glue between servicing or uh, cloud environment. Next, and second is isolated execution. Uh, we can take advantage of this characteristic uh, when we run fast on top of containers. Each function run on uh, independent, independent environment like a uh, container or virtual machine. This approach ensures resource isolation among functions and increases reliability when monitoring individual functions. This is also good for managing resources effectively for system. With the recent prosperity in container technology, many open source are choosing uh, this architecture. And third is uh, state risk. When a function finishes execution, each function returns the, the used resources to the system. At this point, our data stored in local storage and memory will be reclaimed. That is, we are unable to reuse the context in the previous run, and user must assume that the function is called in the new container each time. The fourth is auto-scaling. If there are a lot of requests, 
Uh, the fast, fast platform can increase the number of containers to execution, execute the function in parallel. The scale out is usually supported by default at platform level. The last one is pay as you use. This feature is highly related to scalability. You usually need to pay only for what you do with fast platform. If you request come in three times, three function will be executed and you can only pay for the price of three executions. Then if the suddenly doubles, request suddenly doubles, and six function are executed, you need to pay only for six resources. Normally, CPU, memory, and execution time are taken into account when settling the payment. If you have an app that, that doesn't use a lot of computing resources and uh, run for a few minutes a day, such as a batch program, or backend service, uh, then run at certain time only, the fast platform can be very attractive alternative. So uh, in the past, when you create an application, you create it as a one system. This had a problem of having to redeploy the entire service even with small changes. Because of this drawback in the traditional system, the microservice has come to the fore. In the microservice architecture, system is comprised of many small independent services. Now people are trying to split up into smaller functions. I think this is a kind of trend uh, to minimize the scope of changes to make the system more flexible. It's fast, our future. Let's take a look at the OpenISC, one of the most popular fast open source, to see how does the fast look like and what problem it contains and how we solve the problems. That includes Zhang Peng Chong. Okay, thanks, Connie. I'm Zhang Peng Chen. And uh, next, I will introduce uh, Apache OpenWISC. It's an open source fast platform which is used in the IBM Cloud functions. It's event driven by using triggers to connect uh, external events. And uh, the OpenWISC will associate the trigger with rules with several actions. And the actions here are the functions uh, Gongli mentioned before. They are just some slips of code or users customer barrel codes embedded in a docker image. So with these triggers, rules, and actions, the OpenWISC can run users code in response to external events, like database update or code commit into GitHub, or just simple HTTP, HTTP request. Now let's see the internal flow of the OpenWISC. It's quite simple because you know, only has two particular components, the controllers and the invokers. We can easily find out that the controllers are used to handling all users' requests that forward from the engines, such as the action create, update, and delete, and of course, the invocation request. Once controller receives an invocation request for an action, it will f forward that request request to one of invokers using Kafka. And uh, when invoker got that request, it will then use the Docker container to execute that action's code. So what's the procedure of a Docker container to process the action's invocation request? First, we need to create a container, and the second, we need to initialize the container with the action code. It will inject the action code into that container. And finally, we can execute that action code inside the container. And one thing needs to be mentioned is that if a container is already injected with some action code, for security reason, each action needs to be isolated from other actions. So this container cannot be initialized again with other actions code. 
This means that an invocation request of action B cannot reuse containers that already in initialized with action H code. And from these three steps, we can conclude that there are three types of invocation requests. The first one is code start, which has three steps, the container creation, and the code initialization, and the code execution. And the second one, pre-warm start, we don't need to create a new container for it, just initialize the code and execute the code. And the last one, which only has one step, the code execution, is so-called the warm start. It's clearly that the warm start is the best case for invocation request. It only needs to take several milliseconds. Now let's have a look at uh, the life cycle of a Docker container in the OpenWhisk. At first, the invoke zero will receive an invocation request of action A and uh, start a container creation. And uh, when it creates, the container is become pre-warmed. And we initialize the action A's code into it, and the container become warmed status. And then we execute the action code so now the container is busy. And once the execution is completed, the container will become will go back to warmed and it's ready to handle other uh, another invocation request of action A. It's only for action A, not for any other actions. And uh, if there is a new request, this is a warm start. And uh, when the execution, the second execution completes again, and the container become warmed again. And after some time, this container will be timed out and be terminated if there is no more incoming request for the action A and uh, release the resources to the system. And uh, in a real case, the code start can get even more worse. Let's say we have this warmed containers in the system and uh, here is the invocation of A comes to invoke zero. Uh, this is a warm start, now it's great, but when it comes to the invoke two, yes, we first need to delete a warm container and start a fresh new one and initialize the code and finally we can execute the code. So there is an additional container deletion step to the code start. Now. Here comes a question. What's the best way for the controllers to decide which invoker should be selected to for an act in invocation request? This is what scheduling means in OpenWhisk. And as we already know that, the warm start is much more better than the cold start, right? So for the best system performance, we need to reuse warmed containers as much as possible. So, it is difficult to achieve an optimal scheduling for the open risk. From this diagram, it looks pretty easy, right? Because we already know the invoker status are like this. And for, so for the invocation request, A, B, A, C, we can send the first A to the invoker zero, and B to the invoker one, and the second A request to invoker zero again, and C to the invoker two. And at least we can get three warm start. If we are lucky, we can even get four. It's more than perfect, right? But is that possible to get the invoker's status while we do scheduling? The answer is no. The reason is that the execution time of an action can be very short, like uh, two milliseconds. That means the invoker status can be changed in only two milliseconds. So at this time, you may remember that the invoker status are like this, and it's correct. But after two minutes ago, it's changed, and changed, and changed again. But you, you still think that the invoker status keeps the same from your first sight, which is totally wrong. And uh, there is another issue, that the schedule point can, be hap can happen in many controllers nearly in the same time. So one controller needs to consider other controllers decision without when he made a choice because 
other control stations may change the current invoker status. So to achieve an optimal scheduling for the risk, we need to first collect the real-time resources status of all invokers and then factor in the scheduling duration from other controllers. And for all available invokers, we should choose the best one. And all this process should be done in only two milliseconds. You believe it or not, I think this is kind of impossible. So now you can think about it. How would you design the scheduling for the open risk? Okay, now let's have a look at what OpenWhisk does first. The OpenWhisk will decide the target invoker for action in advance with a hash function. For each action, it will calculate a hash, hash value for it and use the hash value and the number of invokers to get a home invoker. The home invoker will be act as the index of the invoker sequences. So for every action, the OpenWhisk can calculate the can get the home invoker in advance without considering the location of existing containers. But here comes a lot of question: Do we need to consider the capacity of the home invoker? If the home invoker runs out of its resources, should we still send the invocation request to the to it? We should do that because there are still two invokers in idle state. So for this issue, the open ways has another way to resolve it. There is a step sizes which are co-prime numbers that are smaller than the number of invokers. For example, if the size of invokers is 10, then the step sizes is an array of 1, 3, 7. You can think about that why open ways use the Copy numbers here. So for an action A, the step size of it is its hash value more the number of step sizes. Then if the number of invokers is decided for each action, its home invoker and the step size are also decided. And while do scheduling, the open risk will first check the home invoker. And uh, if the home invoker is not capable, we will the, it will pass a safe side to that home invoker and check that invoker, and uh, again and again until it finds a suitable one. If all invokers are busy, the open risk will fall to a plan B. It will randomly randomly select select an invoker for the invocation request. And for the issue that. One controller needs to consider other controllers' decision choice. The open risk uses a sharding strategy to divide each invoker resources into different and independent parts and assign each part to each of controller. So with this approach, the, con the decision on one controller will not affect other controllers' resources. The invocation request that handling by the control zero will, ha will have low e effect on the control one. And uh, so are the invocation requests that are handled by control one. It also has low effect on the control zero's resources. And so is this, there is also low influence for this request. And uh, once execution is over, the system will release all results to each container. And as we described before that uh, the open risk use the hash value while do scheduling. So the invocation of A that handled by control zero or control one will all forward to the invoker zero because it's home invoker is invoker zero, right? And uh, when there is low resources at all, the invocation request will be randomly sent to one of the invokers and wait until the resource is available in that invoker. So with this sharding strategy, the open risk doesn't need to consider other controllers. 
while it do the scheduling. And with these two features, it seems that the issues we mentioned while we do scheduling are all resolved and the system should show a good performance, right? Let's have a look at some benchmark results. The first one is very simple. We only invoke the one single same action during benchmarks and we get a pretty nice TPS and this is great. Now let's try an, uh, another case. We will invoke 100 actions randomly during the benchmarks, but we got a pretty awful TPS, it's only 90. So the, you might be think that there could be some problems in our environment, but trust me, we have lo lo a lot of benchmarks against the 100 actions case, and they all showed the a similar result. So what's wrong with the current scheduling algorithms of the Open risk. Now, take it easy. We will first show the an another benchmark result for the doc demo first. Okay, this is the benchmark against the doc run to doc remove, and we get our only 10 TPS, which is quite slow. But in many people's opinion, including me, we also we think that the doc container is quite fast. Yes, but how can it show this? But without the reason is that the document process requests a sequentially, and because of the same reason, the performance of Docker post to Docker unpost also didn't show any good. It only show about forty TPS. So from many of our tests, the average time of the Docker run to Docker remove will take about 500 milliseconds to 1300 milliseconds. Um, and the post to unpost is about 50 milliseconds and 400 milliseconds. Now, you, some of you may have guessed that why the reason why the TPS of 100 actions are so low. Maybe the mining code start during benchmarks. Yes, you are correct. There are indeed many code starts during benchmarks. Next, I will explain you the reason why it shows on the 100 actions case. The first reason is that there are some interference among actions. Let's say we have two actions which have the same hash value. So they have a home, same home invoker, and now the home invoker have four billion containers. And at some time, one of the containers of A finish its job and become warmed, but here comes the invoke B. What will happen? So there will be a deletion and the counter creation and the initialization and the finally execute. So this is a typical bad code start. And when there is a BDA container for B, become warmed, but here comes the invoke A. As the same version happens again, there is a delete, connect, create, and initialization, and execute. So in this example, the container creation and deletion happens on every invocation request. Well, there are still two invokers are in idle state. This is the worst case because the two actions have a uh, same hash value. If these two ac actions have a uh, have different hash value, this will not happen. The container creation and deletion will not happen, and all containers will be fully reused. But although this is a quite coincidence, in a rare case, this can be happen easily because there might be hundreds of actions in the fly. So there, if there some, there must be some actions share the same ho home invoker. Then code starts happens. So because of this reason, even an action's execution time uh, only take about two milliseconds. But because of the container creation, deletion, the actual execution time can be very large. And uh, 
it can be 650 times slower, and all subsequent requests are also delayed. The second issue is that the invocation doesn't wait for a previous run. What does this mean? I will use an example to explain this. Let's say that the action A execution time is about 20 milliseconds and uh, its invokers are busy now. So for the new request of uh, action A, it will be sent to an another invoker like invoke2 and this is a code start. The create, initialize, and execution. And it will take about 520 milliseconds. But what you wait, don't, don't do schedule, but just wait. In this case, we will wait one of the build containers and the home invoker to become warmed. It will be in 20 minutes later. And then we send that request to the home invoker, and this is a warm start, and it only takes 40 milliseconds. So it's about 13 times faster than scheduling it immediately to an idle invoker. This means that if the execution time of an action is that smaller than 500 milliseconds, which is the time spent to create a new container. We'd better to wait for a previous run finish than schedule it to an uh, idle invoker immediately, right? And uh, there, are still any, there are still other issues in the current scheduling algorithm. You can refer to this URL to see the details if you are interested. And because of there's so big difference between the TPS of one actions and the 100 actions, here comes a new questions that we cannot determine, determine how many TPS our cluster can provide it. For example, if there are only 100 active users and each user invoke one action, we may provide max for 20,000 TPS for it, but if each user invoke 10 actions, the TPS can be reduced to 6,000, and it can even fall to 30 if each user invoke 100 actions randomly. And the max TPS also changed if the active users are changed. Next this, and next this, and next this. So, under the same environment, our system's performance can vary according to the number of active actions and the number of active users. This makes kernel decide when and how to scale up our clusters. The resource planning is very difficult. So now you already know that there are some flaws in the current scheduling of OpenWhisk. Next, Dominic will talk about what we have done to resolve these issues, and uh, what do we get? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Feng Chong. Okay, until now, you guys have seen how OpenISK does work and what is the issues in current OpenISK. And from now on, I will share what we did to overcome the issues. So we introduced the per action queue and pooling based scheduling and we separated container creation from invocation paths and we introduced a couple of new components. So I will share the details in the following slide. Uh, in open source, uh, the invocation request for action A is sent via invoker zero topic. For, invoca uh, for action B, is, it is also sent via invocation uh, invoker zero topic as well. It means that if the invocation of action A is delayed, then invocation of B is also delayed. So we introduced a per action message queue. Now each action has its own message queue A and B. So request for action A is sent to message queue A, and request for action B is sent to message queue B. In this way, even if one action is delayed, it does not block the others. 
And if each invoker fetch all messages from all these message queue, then same thing can happen in invoker side. So we introduce the pooling based scheduling. Now each, invo each container itself pull their messages. And one more benefit of this approach is that controllers do not need to consider the existing location of containers. And each container will fetch messages and it will invoke it and fetch messages and invoke it again and again. So the container reuse is maximized. And in, in open source, uh, when we invoke on an action, if there is no container, then we should create a container first. Only after then we can invoke the action A. It means that container creation time is included in the invocation time. So if creation is delayed, then invocation is also delayed. So when we send the invocation request, we asynchronously send the container creation request as well. Then invoker receives it, and it creates a container, and finally we can execute and invoke, uh, invoke the action. It is seemingly that it is slower than the previous one, right? But actually, these two passes are working almost simultaneously. S and once the container is created, then only these two passes are working repeatedly. So it can be faster. And if one container is not enough to handle all incoming requests, then we can send another container creation request and it will create a container and it will invoke the action. While these red paths are active, still the black passes are working as expected. It means that container creation does not affect the existing invocation anymore. And next one is a new component. Previously, controllers should schedule actions based on their own resource. Now, each invoker periodically store their resource status in SCD, and we introduce distributed transactions before creating containers. So with this, we could get rid of these fragmented controller resources from the control side, and we could manage our resources globally. The final one is a new component, scheduler. We implemented a new queue replacing Kafka. I think many of you guys are already uh, familiar with Kafka. Uh, Kafka is very popular and famous messaging queue, and sometimes it is even considered as a de facto in a messaging queue area. But we could not take advantage of Kafka. So let me share why we did not use this. In Kafka, a topic is comprised of multiple partitions. And partitions is the unit of parallelism. It means that if we need two consumers, then we should have at least two partitions. And if there is more than more number of consumer, then it cannot fetch any message. And it takes, it's not easy to change the number of partitions at one time. So normally it takes uh, several seconds. So what we can do here is we can make big enough partitions in advance but how can you define enough? We cannot make sure how many containers will be required. Some actions may require 300 containers, but the others may require 1,000 containers. So it's not, we cannot decide the number of partitions in advance. The worst thing is, if there is a, a one consumer, then it will be in charge of all three partitions. And if one consumer is added, then they will distri distribute each partition. And one more consumer is added, then all three consumers will be in charge of each partition respectively. This is a process to allocate a, pr a partition to a consumer. In Kafka, in Kafka world, we call this as a consumer rebalancing. And consumer rebalancing happens whenever a consumer is added, and it takes a proportional time to the number of consumers. In our test, it took around 50 seconds to rebalance 200 consumers. As you saw in the previous page, 1.3 seconds 
of Docker daemon performance is also quite big overhead in the serverless world. 50 seconds is definitely not acceptable. And this consumer rebalancing is controlled by Kafka. We cannot control the routing. In the future, we may want to add our own custom routing rule, but we cannot make it with Kafka. So we've implemented a new message queue. It act, uh, acts as a message queue for invocation request. And as the name stands for, it decides when and where to add more, more containers. And we could achieve the full control of routing as we ourselves implemented it from the scratch. In this way, we could resolve action interference with per action message queue. And with pulling based scheduling, we can schedule actions without considering the existing location of containers. And we separated container creation from invocation. So creation does not block the invocation anymore. And we could manage our resource globally with the SCD and distributed transactions. And finally, we could have full control over routing with a new component scheduler. Uh, this is our performance comparison between open source and our new scheduler. And this shows around 155 times more TPS. And actually, we did not enhance or improve the TPS itself. We just made the system show a consistent TPS no matter how many users and how many actions are used. Okay, this is the end of our speech. Thank you for listening. So do you have any questions? Yes, actually, uh, did you have a question? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, he asked about that. Have you considered running um, invo multiple invocation in one container, right? Yeah, actually, in OpenWhisk, we call this as uh, intra concurrency. And it is actually uh, already supported in op Apache OpenWhisk. But uh, it may introduce some uh, security issues because if we run multiple actions in a container at the same time, then they may introduce some confusion between context and uh, all the invocation will share the one resources. So it may, may can be crash if it uh, consume many memories and so on. But anyway, op Apache OpenISC currently support that kind of intra concurrency. Uh, my question was, uh, if there, there, uh, the, uh, there is 500 concurrent requests to the OpenWhisk, yes. so does that mean there will be 500 containers created? Yes, actually, I, I think it's not uh, work, in, uh, work in a way that uh, all 500 c requests come to the system at the same time, but if it, it is so, then it will create 500 containers in parallel, so but while processing them, if the execution time is short enough, then maybe few of them can be reused. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, any other qu questions? Okay. You mean the contribution? Okay. He asked me about, are you willing to contribute this to the upstream? Yeah. Sure. Actually, uh, I'm a committer and PMC member of Apache OpenWhisk, and I am trying to contribute back this implementation to the upstream. So we are working on it now. Yeah. So any other question? Okay. Thank you for listening.